Uh, I'll just say one more thing about Ross and Larry in terms of their own their work and my, and my work. Uh, with regard to Ross Blechner and, and my work, uh, one of the things that I was coming to understand was oil media uh, as a specific characteristic material. And one of the things that Ross was really, that I was able to pick up from Ross was uh, certain characteristics of oil media uh, in terms of process uh, that uh, oil really reads differently than acrylic paint. And uh, if you're talking about illusionism as a quality in painting and you're not disavowing illusionism, oil paint really is the medium of illusionism to some extent. And Ross understood that very well. Uh, and I have to say that I was overly seduced by that aspect of Ross's painting. And it's something that I've been working against subsequently. Um, glazing. <laughs> uh, I don't believe in overworking a painting at all. I try to find strategies that do just the opposite. Uh, I, I feel like you, could, you can uh, kill a painting uh, by going back into it. Uh, Ross, you know, it was the opposite. Overworking was his way of emancipating himself. Um, so, some of those things. With regard to Poons, I was interested, first of all, in the rigor of his optical work. Uh, I was interested in how it responded to the moment of the 60s in terms of my own childhood, a kind of open-eyed idealism. Uh, it was such an expansive time for me. I, I was fortunate enough to go to progressive schools. My parents were very progressive and, and liberal and open-minded. And I really felt that in the art of the 60s. And to me, Larry kind of stood for that. His later work can seem, you know, almost claustrophobic in its density. But I liked the process aspect of it. I liked the material aspect of it. I liked the fact that the gravitational force of the picture plane was the catalyst for what was happening. I like the engagement with paint as paint. Um, and I also just, the, 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 the story really got to me of kind of who he was and what he had done. You know, when we were up at his barn in East Durham, we, we were looking at, you know, his vintage cafe racer. That's what he races, these vintage class motorcycles, single cylinder. Um, 500 cc, you know, he races the whole circuit from Daytona and elsewhere. Uh, but he also, in his garage, had, uh, you know, a sports car that was in a state of disrepair uh, that, you know, was never going to be put back together again. Uh, but in New York, his place, it used to be William Rubin's loft, and it was one of the first spaces designed by the architect Richard Meyer. And it's a real kind of time capsule, you know. He has what he calls the painting cave. And it's literally like Carlsbad Cavern, you know, stalactites of acrylic hanging from two by fours and plastic sheeting. And I remember going in there and, and there was so much plastic sheeting on the floor. You know, he lays down this plastic sheeting and then you get out the five gallon, you know, golden paint buckets. But walking on the floor, it literally was like, psh, and you could hear the air coming out of it. And all of that, I mean, it really killed me to think about the years of this kind of activity and this kind of intensity, but, but also just the wildness of it, you know, that, that, that within the support structure of the New York art community and a kind of painting establishment as represented by the Rubin family, Andre Emmerich, later Salander O'Reilly, you had somebody who was this kind of free spirit renegade operating within those confines, you know, and so different really than Nolan and Olitsky, when, when you, you finally come down to it, and those three painters have always been related to each other. I also love those two other painters, but you know, I realize what's so different. And, and one of the things you're going to encounter when you meet Larry is that he is in that present tense. You know, he is where he is now. He doesn't give a damn about, you know, where he's been. Okay, who's next?